Monica, as I pointed out going into that, what Joe Biden said at the beginning of all this was, watch me. Like, if you have questions about my ability to serve as president, watch me. So that is what we're doing. But he has done far fewer press conferences per year than other presidents previously. Certainly in modern times, you can see the numbers there. Uh, 24 on average for Bill Clinton, 26 for George Bush. Uh, he's done half of that, whether solo or with other world leaders. And I know you've got some new reporting on how he's preparing for tomorrow's big moment. Tell us about it. And Chris, you'd expect that he would prepare for a news conference, even if there wasn't yep. this enormous pressure around him building that is certainly going to put outsized importance potentially on how he performs tomorrow. That is what Democrats are saying publicly. It's what they're saying privately. And it sort of feels like the eyes of the world are on him, not just as he's on the world stage, but as he is going to wrap it up tomorrow with that news conference where, of course, there aren't teleprompters, where he will not be reading from prepared remarks as we've seen in the last couple of days, and where we hope he will, of course, answer a variety of questions from a variety of news outlets from the assembly journalists there. But we do understand, Chris, that he has been going through it, but they admit and concede that it's different than preparing for something like a general election debate, because you don't have the time constraints, and there's a lot of news of day and things that are happening in real time that could impact some of the questions when he faces them tomorrow. But also, to just think about it this way, there isn't an opponent on the stage, but you can think about it as the opponent here for Joe Biden is the entirety of public opinion and of Democrats. Democrats, of those within his own party trying to make up their mind about their assessment of whether he should still be the nominee in November and face Donald Trump. And they are aware of that. There is a heaviness to that, and there is certainly an acknowledgement that that is an important test. But they're trying to cast this as one of a series of tests. And so you're going to see him this week doing these engagements at NATO. You saw him do that interview last week. He's been going out and saying he's going to be doing more campaign events and trying to travel to more battleground states. So the Biden campaign and the reelection effort overall, they are arguing that the news conference tomorrow, while important, they do say that, is not the only measure for which to make this. But I think, as you guys were just talking about Nancy Pelosi's comments, that's a really clear indication that many people are waiting for that news conference to come and go to see how he performs before they go further, potentially, in their comments to either call him out on stepping aside from the race or to try to talk about a different path forward. And there is an awareness within the White House about the stakes of tomorrow's event. In that so regard, let's Chris. talk a little bit more about the state's Congressman, and it's good to see you again. It's been a bit. Um, when I heard Monica use the phrase, the entirety of public opinion, I thought that was a kind of a sobering way to put it, but real. How do you see the stakes? What does Joe Biden need to do? What are you watching for? Well, I think, first of all, in terms of Nancy Pelosi's statement this morning, I have deep and profound respect for Nancy. There's no one like her. Um, but I think the interpretation, and that's exactly what it was, an interpretation by The New York Times. And we know where The New York Times is. They made it perfectly clear where they stand on this issue. Um, let me say this. Uh, Joe Biden uh, has always, throughout his political career, done the right thing. I think he will always do the right thing. That's because he loves his country more than himself. He loves his country more than himself. That's not the same for the other guy in this race. And that's because Joe Biden has something the other guy doesn't have, character. He's a person of character. I think what we see happening right now, Hakeem Jeffries is listening to his, his caucus. I think Chuck Schumer is listening as well. I think they, they, they're really listening to people on the hustings, the people who are out there on the front line in those really difficult districts, and waiting to bring that information together. Yeah, I think this week is an important week as well, what's happening at NATO, what's happening tomorrow in terms of the press conference. But I think Joe Biden, again, he, he's consistently done what's in the best interest of the country and not himself. He thinks right now he should be the the candidate. Uh, my captain, my captain. He's still my captain. So when you hear Nancy Pelosi say, let's wait until after, let's have a little break, let's take a breath, let's wait till after NATO, that's tomorrow. Okay, after NATO is tomorrow. The press conference is tomorrow. What is she suggesting then? Is she giving at least some space to Democrats, do you think, who are in the caucus? who have been waiting, watching, to say, okay, 
wait, watch, and then come forward. Yeah, I recognize that there is, there's anxiety. There's no question about it. It was a terrible debate performance. That was almost two weeks, or was two weeks ago, just about tomorrow. Uh, and you know, there are other issues that aren't being addressed because of the focus and attention here. I think what they're all looking at is what's happening in the front line. They're wanting to hear from those folks. I think that's what Hakeem Jeffries did today, meeting with the front line candidates, also meeting with the new Democrats. The president himself has met with the governors yesterday. He's met with the mayors today, union leaders. I think Chuck Schumer is also hearing from vulnerable Democrats in the Senate. Uh, those are the people that I think they really want to hear from. And they, they, that's who the president needs to be accountable uh, to as well. And I think he will be. So, Ali, you saw the Cook political report move those six states, right, uh, toward Donald Trump. Three of them are battleground states. Is this the kind of metric that is being followed closely in the halls of Congress, say, especially if you're in a swing district or in one of those battleground states, sort of put into perspective how all of this plays together? People are 100 percent paying attention to changes being made like that. Cook is widely respected here. It's usually used as a nice metric for us on the Hill to gauge where things are at, pulling all polling and other metrics together to get a sense of what things could be like electorally. And members were already nervous about this. I mean, it's not just a question of what a bad debate performance means for Joe Biden. None of this happens in a vacuum. This is the man at the top of the ticket and what's informing a lot of the panic and, frankly, a lot of of the people who have come out recently, I'm thinking specifically of just Pat Ryan in New York, who just in the last few minutes tweeted that he wants Joe Biden to no longer be the nominee. Being in a swing district, being what we call a frontline Democrat right now, that means that you are one of the most vulnerable people on a map to lose your seat. That is so central to this entire conversation around should Biden stay or should Biden go. I think it's also important when we talk to the senators. I mean, the the fact that we're looking at Senator Michael Bennett as one of the early ones, the earliest, to come out and say he has serious electability concerns about not just losing the White House, but about losing the Senate and the House. That idea of losing a trifecta to Republicans has Democrats really freaked out right now, Chris, and it's certainly something that we're hearing about. So when you look at states like Arizona, which Democrats are so hungry to pick up with the candidacy of Ruben Gallego there as the Democratic standard bearer, when you look at a state like Georgia that Democrats felt so good about being able to notch into the blue column in 2020. Those are states that they're watching really closely. And it says nothing of, of places that are not actually on this screen, like Pennsylvania, for example, where they already knew they had a tough slog in key Senate races, and this might make it only harder. That specter of electability or a drag on the ticket down ballot is so central to this conversation for Democratic electeds. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.